Uh, what's one of the most important characteristics in our relationships? And there's lots of things we look for uh, when we're interacting with other people and that we'd like to spend more time with. One of the challenges, I think, in our culture is that we often look for people who look a lot like us. Uh, basically same age, uh, same kind of status in life, same kind of uh, relationship status, same kind of income status, same kind of uh, child status. And our assumption is, is that we will, we will get along better with them if they're more like us. And certainly that can be easier, but it's not always better. And so uh, we're going through this uh, book of Proverbs, and we're finding out that, that wisdom is, it, it comes to bear on our relationships. It's not just that you know smarter things and you can, you can be more aware. It's that it affects us. In fact, if you're going through the Proverbs project with us and, and, um, and looking at the devotions every day, you're going to see how this week, how wisdom from God actually helps our interactions with Him, but also our interactions with other people who are in authority in the world and our interactions with other people who are our neighbors and our friends. Their wisdom has a lot of fruit to bear in many areas of our lives. One of the things that is a critical characteristic is honesty. Honesty. We just want to hear truth. And we can be pretty upset. In fact, there's a lot of raw emotions that happen in our lives when we feel like someone that we've trusted has been dishonest with us. I mean, if, if you feel like your spouse has lied to you, it's really hard to get around that. If you feel like your children have lied to you, like that's a very difficult thing. And it's not just because you're frustrated with that situation. Like with a child, you think, what if they continue in this pattern for the rest of their lives? Like, where could that take them? And so we, we have a lot of very raw emotions around that. And it's not just the closest of relationships, any relationship. So we want people to be honest with us about them. Do we want people to be honest with us about us? That's where it gets more challenging. This is what Proverbs says in Proverbs 6. What are worthless and wicked people like? They are constant liars. Those are two categories you don't want to be in. And yet the defining common denominator of both of those categories is lying. Proverbs 12 says this, the Lord detests. That's a strong word. If your, if, if your spouse made you dinner and asked how it was and you said, I detest this, that's pretty strong language. It's also going to lead to further conversation. But he delights in those who will tell the truth. He detests those who tell lies. He delights. He takes great pleasure in people who tell the truth. Proverbs 15 says that gentle words are a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. And I didn't have to read that passage of scripture for you to already know that's true. You've had your spirit crushed when you found out something that was told you was not true. Lies, as it turns out, diminish life. It reduces it. Now, generally we say, well, that lie wasn't that big a deal. That's usually the one we told. It's the lies other people tell that we think are the really big deal. It feels a lot worse when the lie is told to us. And it can break trust. And now how can you go on with a relationship where trust has been broken? And some people think, well, if you just forgive them, then the trust is automatically restored. Those are two very separate things. You can forgive someone and still not trust them. Trust has to be rebuilt. Forgiveness is a gift, but trust is earned. And so we have to think about this. And there are clever ways, like people have come up with ways uh, to, to be dishonest, to lie. For example, we might repeat the exact words someone said, but out of context so that it sounds like they were saying something else. 
It's not, it's, we're not telling the truth, but it's, if, if somebody had a recording of those words, see, they said that. Or um, how many are aware we are in a political season? No, I'll just tell you. So in case, I don't want you to be caught by surprise, but there's elections coming up and people are, are, are deciding who they want to vote for or maybe who they don't want to vote for. And here's the warning I will give you. There are Christians on both sides of the political aisle who are lying. Christians about their own political parties or about their parties they oppose. And they are more concerned in winning a political victory than their own righteousness. We should think about this. Proverbs tells us that's a very unwise way to go about life. So this is another thing. Lying actually helps sin to spread. It helps sin to spread. Um, lying is... Uh, Lying has a way to distort reality. And this is what's really weird about this. You can distort reality with your words. Just think about that. You can use your words to help people think differently about yourself or about somebody else. And when those words are not true, we're manipulating reality with the words that are coming out of our mouth. This is what uh, the... Apostle John said in 1 John, the first chapter, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. We should be honest about that. If we're not honest about that, the truth is not in us. And if we tell lies, there's no way to avoid living a lie. Now, there may be lots of reasons we don't want to tell the truth. We can feel challenged. We can feel embarrassed. We, it's just we, we don't want people to know what the truth is in that situation. But nothing imprisons us or enslaves us more than living a lie. It's amazing the incredible power it gains in our lives. So uh, this tends to be true about me. Maybe it's true about you. I don't tend to see my own flaws all by myself. And so if I didn't have someone else in my life that could call attention to some of those things, I might never give attention to some of those things. I need that help. And, and we, we can do a lot of mental gymnastics, okay? Maybe, maybe we've got a friend and, and they, they just drive a really nice car and they live in a really big house and they wear really expensive clothing. And, and you know what we can think about them? We can tell ourselves this. They are so materialistic. That's just, I can't believe they call themselves a Christian and they're so materialistic. And maybe they aren't materialistic at all. Maybe we're just envious. This is what it says in Proverbs 14. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body, but jealousy is like cancer in the bones. And you know what? I have never identified envy in my own life. I've always needed someone who would tell me the truth about that. Uh, there's a movie, it's rather famous, it's called A Few Good Men. Two uh, notable actors in it, one Tom Cruise. And in that movie, Tom Cruise's character is known to say, I just want the truth. Yeah? And then the character played by Jack Nicholas says, you can't, you know that movie. You can't handle the truth. Jesus' character was being played by Jesus in John 8 when he said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So who are you going to believe, Jack or Jesus? We tell ourselves all the time, I can't handle the truth. I've actually had people say, just lie to me. Just lie to me, it'd be easier. It might be easier, but it's not better. Truth leads to freedom. Truth 
empowers. So why do we struggle to tell the truth? And this is the big reason why we struggle to tell the truth. Truth reveals what we would rather conceal. It brings out into the open, out into the light, things we wish nobody would pay attention to. We don't want anybody to see that. It's embarrassing. Like we would rather hide that. There are things that we struggle with and we don't want anyone to know about. So we can be dishonest about some of the things that we've done that are not good, but we can also be dishonest in other ways. Sometimes we're dishonest about the reason we did good things. For people who are really religious, that's often a common struggle. What is the reason we're doing what we're doing? We like to appear strong. We want to appear self-sufficient. We want to appear confident. We want to appear self-controlled. We want to appear loving. All of these things are part of what we want to appear. And when we're not those things, it is so easy to create a little distortion field just by saying things in a certain way. And we use our energy to tell a lie instead of using our energy to actually address what's wrong. And you've only got so much energy. How many have already figured that out? Yeah, some of you don't even have the energy to raise a hand. You just <laughs> used it all up. Uh, we know something's not right, and that's why we're tempted to lie. When someone calls us on something, instead of just acknowledging it, we panic. And now we want to say something that is not true. Some people have ended relationships, ended friendships, ended marriages because they didn't want the other person to find out the truth about them. Just think about that. How powerful has that become in a person's life? Now, I do think that we all want someone that we can be completely honest with. I think we do desire that. I think at the end of the day, we would rather deal with the issues in our life rather than constantly hide them and live with a kind of deception about them. But here's the thing about truth. It's not just the things we say to someone else. It's the things we invite other people to say to us. And are we willing to open our own heart to the truth? And I think our soul actually longs for the truth. I think we struggle when we don't hear it. But the question is, are we willing to invite others to speak truth into our lives? When they do, will we listen carefully for those kernels and grains of truth that are embedded in the words they are speaking to us? Or will we cut people off if they get too close to the truth in our lives. Here's the thing about truth. Truth must be spoken. Truth must be spoken. It can't just be thought. It has to be converted to words, and it has to be spoken. Um, here's, so here's the thing about this. I think that when we speak lies, something in us gets weaker. And I think when we speak truth, something in us gets stronger. And so like when we're engaged in worship earlier uh, this morning, we're declaring true things about God. And something in us gets stronger for speaking and singing that truth. I think our culture tells us all the time that our words don't matter, that our actions don't matter. And I think Christianity confronts this in so many ways and in ways that are actually quite safe. We come into a space like this and we have the opportunity to prove that our words and our actions do matter, that I'm not just going to stand here and observe what's going on around me, but I will use my own voice because your voice matters. And if you don't think so, it's because you've been listening to someone other than God. Your voice matters. Your actions matter. They make a difference in our world. And truth must be spoken. Now, uh, one of my uh, opportunities in life, at the season of life I'm in, I get to serve on a number of boards. I know some of you think that that would be boring. 
And it can be, for sure, but every once in a while, I'll have the opportunity to ask a question that will reveal truth or to speak a truth, and I'm very well aware that that might not be appreciated. And I really struggle whether I'm going to say anything or not. And if you ever do say something and people are frustrated with you about it, it makes it super hard to say it the next time. In our world, if you speak the truth, it can cost you. It can feel awkward. It may feel like a door is closing that you would rather keep open. Unspoken truth allows lies to prevail. And so we have to learn how to speak the truth. The reason we speak the truth is not to put people down or create distance. The reason we speak the truth is because it leads to freedom. There's a couple examples of this. Well, there's many in scripture. I'll call attention to two. There was a guy in the Old Testament named David, and he was uh, the second king of Israel and one of the most famous kings in all of scripture. And, and uh, he actually got to a place where he wound up having committing adultery with a woman whose name is Bathsheba. And when you're king, not a lot of people are going to challenge you on that. And he went, not just only committed adultery by taking another man's wife, but then because he wanted her, he went and had her husband killed. So he's guilty of adultery and he's guilty of murder. And when you're king, not a lot of people are going to challenge you. It's not like nobody knew. It's just that nobody would say anything. And, and then enters into David's life a man by the name of Nathan, who's a prophet. And Nathan challenges David on his actions. And David actually repents. It's a fascinating thing. Why did, why did Nathan challenge David? Well, he just thought that was wrong. I think you need a better reason than that. I think he actually loved David. And I think he was worried that if a guy can get away with adultery and get away with murder and nobody ever challenges him, I don't know where that trajectory is going to take him, but his soul is at risk and his kingdom is at risk and his family is at risk and somebody needs to say something. And so he spoke up, which was not easy for him to do. And kings, as a rule, don't like to be confronted. But he did that. And what we discover is David repented because truth was spoken. David actually had the opportunity to repent. And it didn't end there. David's relationship with Nathan continued to be good. David had a, a son by the name of Adonijah, um, kind of like Adonis, only Adonijah. And Adonijah, uh, David is old at this point, and Adonijah thinks he wants to be the next king, so he just declares himself to be the next king. He throws a party and everything. And uh, listen to this. Nathan actually goes to Bathsheba and informs her, and David and informs him, and then gives counsel on how to handle that. If that relationship had been destroyed because somebody spoke truth into their lives, Israel could have ended up with a king that could have been very destructive to them. It's just fascinating. Oh, there's another example. Um, in the New Testament, uh, Peter gets a lot of press. Uh, he's always doing something, and most of it's embarrassing. He just, he's, he's a guy, my favorite verse about Peter in the Bible is on the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and it says, Peter did not know what to say, so he said. <laughs> That's Peter, <laughs> everything you need to know. He abhors silence. He just has to say something, even if it's stupid. Sometimes he gets it right, sometimes not. And he had heard about the work that God was doing through the apostle Paul and the Gentiles in the Galatian church. And so he makes a trip down there to see him. And he's so overwhelmed by what he's seeing. And there's so much good that's happening that he is enjoying the fellowship and he's eating with Gentiles and he's worshiping with Gentiles and he's talking with Gentiles, and going to Gentiles houses, all of these things. It's all wonderful until some highly respected leaders from Jerusalem come and they are not of the persuasion that Gentiles can become Christians unless they submit to all the Jewish laws, including circumcision. And so when they show up, all of a sudden, Peter starts sitting at a different table. He won't eat with these people anymore. He won't talk to them anymore. He creates distance. And 
Paul confronts him openly about this. Why? Because Paul loves Peter. In Peter's actions, there's another person who's known as one of the most encouraging people in the entire New Testament. His name is Barnabas. That was his nickname, son of encouragement. And, and Barnabas got caught up in what Peter was doing by separating himself, and he started doing the same. And because Paul loved Peter, and he didn't want Peter to become this isolated person who would lose his influence in the kingdom, and because he loved the Gentiles, and he didn't want them to feel less than because all of a sudden someone thought they were less, he confronts them. And the result is, is that they worked that situation out. And it was a significant season in the life of the church because they learned a lot of good things. And after that, now, Paul spoke truth to Peter because he loved him. But after that, what we see is that Peter actually says some good things about Paul. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, he says, Paul's writings are difficult to understand, but he puts them on the same level as Scripture. He said, there are some people who can misinterpret them and do horrible things, but they do that with all kinds of Scripture. So he's elevated the, the writings of Paul to Scripture. That's quite a remarkable thing to do. And Paul also talks about Peter in 1 Corinthians, about what a significant and, and important leader he is in the church and how he has incredible influence in God's kingdom. See, the enemy would like to tell us that if we speak the truth, it ends relationships. But that's not true. It's just another lie. Uh, they both wound up showing respect to each other. So truth must be spoken, but truth must be spoken in love. Truth must be spoken in love. Um, it feels to me that when it comes particularly to social media, some people remove a couple layers of filter. And they just let things fly because there's not a real human being standing in front of them. And we should think about that. Well, I'm just telling the truth. Maybe. But you're telling the truth without love. And in case you're interested in how God thinks about that, the truth spoken without love is just another form of a lie. And this is what it says in Ephesians 4. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow. Speaking in the truth in love will cause us to grow, to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Ask the worship team to come up. There are those who will speak truth, but they do it in very harsh and brutal ways. Sometimes they're not trying to help people. They're just trying to create distance from people they don't want to be around. And Paul says, we must speak the truth in love. In fact, the only way to become more like Christ, to grow in Christ, is to speak the truth in love. By the way, there's a very practical way for us to practice telling the truth, in case you're interested in an exercise. And this is a low-risk exercise. You ready? You can practice confession. That when you have a conversation with God and you acknowledge truth about yourself, confession is a great way to practice telling the truth. It builds a truth-telling muscle. Remember we, we referred to 1 John, the first chapter earlier? It says if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us, but it goes on. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Honesty opens our eyes. We begin to notice things that need attention. And this is where we need to know. God loved us enough to tell us the truth. God tells us we're not perfect. And God tells us no matter how hard we try, 
We won't become perfect, we'll become better. But that's not perfection. That the lies that we have told others have hurt others and it's hurt ourselves. That our selfish actions have taken advantage of others so that we would benefit. And God loves us enough to tell us the truth. He's not trying to demean us or distance himself from us. He just tells us, this is what's true. And no matter how hard we try, we will not be perfect. That's what's true. But this is also true. He paid the most unbelievable price so that we could be forgiven and restored in our relationship with him. That is also true. Now, I know there are people who say, why can't you just forgive without that, 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 that expensive cost? And this is what I will tell you. If you've ever forgiven anybody for something significant, you know you paid a cost. That was not just a mental switch you flipped. There was a price that you paid when you decided you were going to forgive somebody. Every lie we tell. Every lie we believe makes us weaker. Hear what God says. You are sons and daughters of the Most High King. You are deeply loved and you have a purpose and a future that's breathtaking. And anybody who tells you differently is using their words to distort reality. We need the truth. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I ask that you would help us because no wisdom is ever gained from a lie. Help us begin in our understanding of truth from hearing the truth that you speak to us and then liberate us to be able to speak truth in love in our world. Not only for our own sakes, but the, for the sakes of people that we love. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.